it's mostly focused on spina bifida. We talk kind of about you know neural tube defects in general. Um, so what what is spina bifida? Um, I guess I just general definite general big picture. <clears throat> Layman's terms basically just when the um, I'm trying to think when the spinal not cord <laughs> um, when there's an issue basically like completing the formation of the spinal canal um, usually in the posterior side from like yeah so I'll go even simpler than that the neural tube defect involving the spine perfect yeah so simple <laughs> neural tube defect involving the spine so we can have neural tube defects that involve anything along the the central nervous system which is you know the neural tube forms the central nervous system so when we talk about neural tube defects it's a failure of the process of the neural tube forming and closing correctly so it can affect the brain spine the spinal anything within the spinal canal or the spinal column um, and it just somewhere along there it doesn't close the way that it's supposed to it's the second most most common birth defect worldwide um, what do you guys think is the most common congenital condition worldwide? Ooh. Big uh, picture uh, again. <laughs> most common congenital, you know, defect. You see them in the PICU all the time and nobody wants to take care of them. <laughs> uh, gosh. A loaded question because <laughs> I don't see yeah. uh, it. I mean, premature prematurity count. I don't think so, but uh, uh, defect. so cardiac stuff. Okay. Oh, I thought, about, okay. I thought about that for a second. Yeah. So cardiac cardiac is the most common birth defect worldwide. Neural tube defects are the second most common, but neural tube defects are the most common associated with long term survival. Um, so, in, you know, big picture, we see the survival rate of neural tube defects longer than those of cardiac defects. See about 300,000 cases per year worldwide, about 3,000 per year in the United States. Neural tube defects in general can be open or closed, and this is referring to whether or not the lesion is covered by skin or there's an open defect. Okay. Uh, so kind of going back a little bit, this is what you know the the process of the neural tube closing looks like um you know the embryology that we all thought was a waste of time in medical school here it is coming back to haunt <laughs> well, the neural tubes we talked about is kind of the it, what it's what forms the central nervous system so the brain the spinal cord we see the cord start to fold and fuse around day 21 of gestation and it starts to close at what's going to wind up being the cervical junction. And then it simultaneously goes roughly and caudally at the same time. So it's not a straightforward. It goes from the top to the bottom. Um, it kind of starts not quite in the middle, but it goes both directions. There's less you know, distance for it to travel in the rostral direction. So that that part should be closed by day 24 of gestation and cotillin should be closed by day 28 of gestation so this is happening early on a lot of times before um woman would even know that she's pregnant when we talk about the different types of neural tube defects it's all a matter of where did the defect happen along the way and so we see you know different severities of that craniorachiosis is the most severe neural tube defect. This is where the neural tube doesn't form at all. Um, so it's just complete um, malformation. It doesn't fold, it doesn't close. So you have a combination of anencephaly, which is failure of the rostral end of the neural tube to develop, and you have spina bifida, which is failure of the caudal end of the neural tube to, to close. This is incompatible with, with life. Uh, I intentionally did not include a picture of it, so that's not a broken link. I did that on purpose just because craniorachiosis is not a pleasant thing to look at. 
if you feel inclined, you can Google it and see some pictures of it. And when you see some pictures of it, you'll know why I did not include a picture of it in here. Yeah. Uh, Craniorhachia schizis tends to occur more in the Hispanic population and drives some of the thought process on the genetics involved with it. And cephaly, as I said before, is failure of the rostral end of the neural tube to close. Um, so we don't see much, you know, higher level brain development, no cerebrum, the skull's open. We might see some mid and high brain structures formed. Uh, most fetuses with anencephaly spontaneously abort. Those that are live born don't survive infancy. On the rostral end as well, we can see what's called an encephalus seal, which is where there's a sac like protrusion through a defect in the skull. And that sac like protrusion can, contains neural tissue, contains elements of the brain. Um, it can happen anywhere, but it usually is more posterior and occipital. Um, these infants usually do live, but can have a variety of developmental delays, intellectual disabilities, seizures, cerebral palsy, um, hydrocephalus. The, you know, they usually have some chronic quality as a result of this. Moving into spina bifida then, as I said, spina bifida is a neural tube defect involving the spinal column. And so we can see different types of spina bifida depending on where the problem lies. And with those different types of spina bifida, we can see a variety of different physical developmental impairments because it can affect neural function. Um, and really the severity is dependent on the type of spina bifida as well as uh, the level of the lesion. And this kind of shows a little bit of the open versus closed, which we also refer to as cystica versus occulta. So you can see the pictures on the right. Spina bifida occulta, uh, the skin is covering this. So this would be a closed lesion. Um, does its skin cover? And you look over at myelomeningocele, there's no skin covering this. Meningocele can kind of vary just depending on how big the defect is. And sometimes there might be some skin covering it. Sometimes there might not be any skin covering, but there's still a cystic lesion protruding out from it. Uh, we'll go through these a little bit more in depth, but big picture, we see a lot more uh, impairments with a myelomeningocele. So when we look at the differences between them, just since we have this open, the spina bifida occulta, there's a bony defect in the spine. We don't really get any sac-like protrusion um, through anywhere, and there's not really any neural tissue involvement. With a meningocele, which is the least common form, we get a sac-like protrusion through a defect in the spine. It contains CSF, but it doesn't contain really any neural elements. And then a myelomeningocele, we have a large defect in the spinal column uh, with a sac like protrusion through that, that contains neural elements in there. The myelomeningocele tends to be the most severe and most common as far as having neurologic impairment. What about myelomeningocele do you think causes the neurologic impairments? Why do we see issues with myelomeningocele but not meningocele or spina bifida occulta? I mean, I guess, I mean, just the fact that the Neural elements aren't really protected as much by the skin or by the, um, I mean by the by the cord itself, I guess. Protected from what? You're on the right track. Oh, uh, so I mean from like external trauma, um, most likely, um, but could also be you know infection if you think about the lack of layers of protection on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of other things too, but those things come to mind right now. And then on top of that, it looks like the nerves would be displaced so you would have concerns of possible like tethering mm -hmm. um and but yeah the biggest thing and the most immediate part of it would be like infection with the sac and if there is any type of like csf leakage so i mean you know when the fetus is developing it's in the womb so there's theoretically oh. exposure to infection right oh okay oh. <laughs> So, you know, I was talking about after they're okay. born, the damage is already done. So, yes, there is after they're born increased exposure to infection, but this is something that happens during development, right? So, 
all the the damage is done during fetal development. So what what is the the fetus bathed in as it's developing? Amniotic amniotic fluid. Mm -hmm. So when we have this type of lesion, the nervous tissue gets exposed to that amniotic fluid and the amniotic fluid is toxic to the nervous system tissue and can damage it. Oh. So the, the neurologic impairment from myelomeningocele comes not from the lesion itself. It comes not necessarily from the displacement of the elements, but because that displacement exposes them to the amniotic fluid, which is toxic to that tissue. Um, and that's also part of why we can see kind of a, a variety of impairments. You can have two people that have a L4 level myelomeningocele based on anatomy, but might have different level of function just because, you know, as the fetus moves, the shifts, the amount of time the different elements are exposed to amniotic fluid and what parts of them are exposed to amniotic fluid is going to vary, you know, fetus to fetus. That's also part of why we can sometimes see kind of an asymmetric picture as well. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, going a little bit more into spina bifida culture, which is that first one. Like I said, that's the mildest form. There's a small defect in the spinal canal, um, usually in the lumbar sacral area, but there's no neural involvement. There's no sac-like involvement. There's no protrusion of anything. There's no Chiari malformation. And it's typically an incidental finding. These individuals are usually asymptomatic. A lot of times it might be someone in their 20s, 30s, 40s. They have back pain and they get an x-ray and, oh, you're you know missing a part of your spinal column. You have spina bifida culto. They had no symptoms at all. Or maybe they had some you know, back pain and it could be related to that. A lot of times they are asymptomatic. Um, this is you know, part of why you do a good thorough newborn exam and you look at their back when you see a, a sacral dimple or a hairy tuft or a pigment in nevis. And you'll, you're looking to see, you know, with a sacral dimple, is there a well defined, um, you know, does it just kind of keep going and going or is it shallow? Uh, you look at the function of their legs and, you know, if you have any concerns, you get an ultrasound of their spine to look more in-depthly at this. There is a risk for a tethered cord, um, which Francis, you kind of mentioned, is a risk for all of these with a tethered cord, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. There's an abnormal attachment at the caudal end of the cord, and so it puts some tension stress on the cord. It can cause some hypoxic injury. Um, and so while someone with spina bifida culta may be asymptomatic, there is a risk for you know, developing a tethered cord in their life. Nengo seal is the middle one. Now that's the least common form. That's where we get that cystic lesion protruding through a defect in the spinal canal, but there's no spinal cord involvement. And since there's no spinal cord involvement, the spinal cord's not exposed to the amniotic fluid and it's not damaged. So we usually don't see a whole lot of um, physical impairment or neurologic impairment right off the bat with these patients either. A lot of times it's just a sac, it gets repaired and they kind of go about without any you know, problems at all. There is a risk of tethered cord with meningocele as well. And it's a little bit hard to say both with spina bifida culta and meningocele what that risk actually is because the only time we do imaging to look for a tethered cord is if there are signs of a tethered cord. Um, having a meningocele or having a um, spina bifida occulta is not an indication to do routine imaging of the spine looking for a tethered cord because even if there's imaging that shows it, but there are no clinical impairments, we're not going to do anything about it. Um, so that's an example where, you know, if you're getting an MRI, it needs to change your management. Um, if and so because of that, we don't really know what the prevalence rate of meningus or tethered cord within meningus seals and uh, spina bifida occulta are just because we're not routinely looking for it. Um, and then myeloma meningus seals, the most severe form as we saw in that picture, there's the dysplastic neural elements in that sac like protrusion through that large defect and those neural elements are exposed to the amniotic fluid and it damages that tissue. Um, 
about 90% of individuals with myeloma meningocele also have what's called a Chiari 2 malformation um, with hydrocephalus. What happens with that, a Chiari 2 malformation is where um, because all those elements are kind of pulled out into the sac, it puts tension on the spinal cord and it actually pulls the spinal cord down. The spinal cord's attached to the brain and so it pulls um, a lot of times the occipital lobe down into the frame of magnum. And when that happens, it compresses the fourth ventricle. When the fourth ventricle is compressed, the CSF can't flow properly and we get hydrocephalus. Um, and so majority of these patients have hydrocephalus. The lower the level of lesion, the less likelihood for this, just because there's more slack in the, the cord. Um, so we definitely see a lot more rates of hydrocephalus in someone with a thoracic level lesion than we would in someone with a sacral level lesion. But there are sometimes kids with a thoracic lesion that doesn't have a, that don't have hydrocephalus or don't need a shunt, and there are kids that have a sacral level lesion that sometimes do. Um, the level of impairment is usually kind of at the lesion level and then below, um, just because all those those elements are affected. When we look at kind of the level of lesions, we look at anatomic, but we also look at function. So we look at our dermatomes and our myotomes. Do you guys remember dermatomal, myotomal distributions? Generally. Sort of. But. <laughs> so when we talk about dermatomal distribution, it's more effective when looking at thoracic level things. So, you know, spinal cord injury, um, because the, the dermatomes in the thoracic region are very, very well defined. When we get into lumbar sacral level dermatomal distribution, it's not a very clear picture. Uh, it's, you know, part of the inner thigh and outer thigh is L2. It's just, it's not straightforward. So when we get into lumbar level things, we look more at the myotomal distribution, which is the more so L2 is your hip flexion. Hip flexion is being able to raise your knee. Um, you can't really see me, so I'm not going to do it because I would be doing it for myself. Um, so that's kind of flexing your hip is the ability to raise your knee. That's L2. Knee extension is then straightening, straightening your leg, which brings your foot up. That's L3. L4 is kind of your... Um, dorsiflexion of your foot, so bringing your foot and toes up towards your head, and then getting L5-S1 is moving your toes and plantar flexion of your foot. So we look at, you know, what is their strength with those different um, muscle movements? Where is bowel and bladder control? Uh, the, the distribution of this kind of function. S1 down. Yeah, I want to say it's, yeah. Yeah, so we're, you know, we're S4, S5, so it's right. kind of at the bottom. So 9% uh, okay. of individuals with spina bifida are going to have some degree of bowel and bladder dysfunction. Um, so some of the impacts we see, bowel and bladder dysfunction, loss of sensation. Uh, we can see orthopedic issues as well, so we can see a variety of contractures different forms of club feet, knee contractures, foot contractures. And, you know, similar to, you know, the risk for hydrocephalus and anything else, the different level of lesion really kind of has an impact on what types of orthopedic injuries that we can see or orthopedic um, deformities we can see. As far as what causes spinal <laughs> It's multifactorial as a lot of things are. Um, you know, we do know there are a lot of genetic things involved. Part of the what leads us to know that is, like I said, with craniorachiasis, we see a much higher rate with the Hispanic population. Um, there's thought that the different genes involved, or the different gene changes involved, um, have a role in where the lesion level is. Uh, as opposed to just kind of being a random type of thing. We see a, an increased recurrence rate. So if a female has a child with spina bifida or a neuro two defect, the recurrence risk goes up to 4% for her next child. If she has two children, the recurrence risk goes up to 10%. If a female herself has 
a neural tube defect or spina bifida, the risk of her children having it automatically goes up to 4%. We see a slightly higher rate in females versus males, but not huge. Um, but we do see amongst different um, races and ethnicities change in rate. And again, probably getting into some of the genetics involved. On the environmental risk factors, low socioeconomic status, uh, that seems to be a risk factor for most things. You know, when we talk about um, congenital defects, midspring conception is a risk factor. I cannot tell you why, but it just has been found to be a risk factor. Maternal obesity, maternal diabetes are risk factors. Again, those, you know, there's several things associated with that. One of the other things we'll see in spina bifida clinic um, is what's called caudal regression syndrome or sacral agenesis. That's important to note because maternal diabetes is a strong risk factor for caudal regression syndrome, and that is typically a board question. Um, so that's, you know, one to just make note of. You'll usually have one question about that, and that's usually kind of the association is maternal diabetes and caudal regression syndrome. Caudal regression syndrome isn't a neural tube defect and that it's not a failure of the neural tube to close. Um, but because of there's two schools of thought um, as far as what causes it, but basically the caudal end of the spinal column doesn't form correctly, hence sacral agenesis. Um, one of, so there's two things that happen. One is that there's a problem with mesoderm differentiation, again, that embryology. And the other is that there is an aberrant blood flow. One school of thought is that the mesoderm differentiation problem causes the aberrant blood flow, and the other is that the aberrant blood flow causes the mesoderm differentiation problem. But both of them happen. It's kind of a matter of, you know, chicken or egg type of thing. With caudal regression syndrome, we can see some of the, you know, physical impairments. We can see some of the neurogenic bowel and bladder, but we don't really see the risk for hydrocephalus because again the spinal column and the spinal cord is not being pulled down it just doesn't form correctly one of the other risk factors is medications so especially the seizure medications what's kind of the big one the most common one that is a risk factor for neural tube defects the valproic acid exactly valproic acid depakote um, so if you have a patient who has seizure history and is on Depakote and they come to you, they are eight weeks pregnant. What's your recommendation as far as what to do with the Depakote? Is it just to keep continuing it if they've already been on it? Right. And why should we just go ahead and continue it? Um, I think at eight weeks pregnant, number one, the time at which these defects would have heard it already passed and then also it's just benefit versus risk seizures versus yep. um risk for these issues yeah yep and that's right on the damage has already been done and at this point in time stopping the medication is more of a risk to the the mom and the fetus <coughs> continuing we can also see heat exposure be a risk factor, especially early on in pregnancy. So it's recommended that, you know, women that are pregnant don't, you know, take real long hot baths. They don't get a hot tub, avoid using, you know, heated blankets, uh, you know, heated seats in the car even. Those types of things should be kind of avoided and minimized. And we see, you know, differences in geography. This gets into kind of the socioeconomic status and access to medical care. We see more of, risk of developing countries. In the United States, we tend to see higher rates on the East Coast and the West Coast. This is mostly because of the Appalachian population and again, kind of decrease access to, you know, health care, um, folic acid fortification, those types of things. We try to diagnose it prenatally. Um, it used to be done through looking at maternal serum alpha feta protein levels. Uh, elevations could be associated with spina bifida or neural tube defect, but a lot of things can cause an elevated alpha feta protein level. So there's a lot of false positives. Um, and anytime you get a positive, you know, it's falling up with an amniocentesis, which can be, you know, have risks that come along with that too. So as fetal ultrasound technology developed, it really increased the reliability of being able to diagnose these prenatally. 
mostly with the open neural tube defects, it is still hard to reliably identify the closed skin covered lesions through fetal ultrasound technology. Uh, as they started being able to more reliably diagnose these prenatally, they started doing prenatal repairs of the Milo lesion. Uh, they started doing it, and then you know the powers that be, whoever they are, said, "Hold on, we have to actually show that this improves outcome." So they started what's called what was called the MOM study, Management of Milo Meningocele Study. There were three surgical centers across the country that were doing randomized controlled trials of prenatal repair of the myelo lesion versus carrying to term and repairing postnatally. They were looking at two major outcomes. One was the need, you know, hydrocephalus and the need for a shunt, and the other was motor milestones at 18 months of age. And they had actually stopped the study early because the results were overwhelmingly positive, um, that there was a significant decrease in the rates of needing a shunt to treat hydrocephalus as well as improved motor outcomes at 18 months of age. Now, it's not a foregone conclusion that if you have spina bifida and it's diagnosed prenatally that you have the surgery, it's a discussion about the risk versus benefits because it is prenatal surgery. That in and of itself comes with risk. One of the other risks that we see is an increased rate or increased risk for prematurity. So the average gestational age of a child born with spina bifida that doesn't have the surgery that's carried to term is 37 weeks and some change, which is you know considered full term. Average gestational age of someone who's had the surgery is 34 weeks. So that is you know premature. So there's a risk with that. The there's a lot of follow up going on with the mom study. So they're looking at like cognitive outcomes right now um, as well. And I actually have a patient who follows in Milo Clinic who had a prenatal surgery done at CHOP, which was one of the original sites in that mom study, who just last year went for neuropsych testing as part of long term follow up with that. Some of the kind of secondary and tertiary measures that they're tracking. If it is a known diagnosis, they are delivered via C section, um, but there are certainly populations where, you know, if, uh, mom really didn't have any access to prenatal care um, and didn't know about it, then they might not be delivered via C-section. Uh, if it's delivered vaginally, then it increased the risk for, you know, trauma to the cord, um, rupturing the sac, which predisposes to infection, which is kind of some of what you guys were getting at back when we were talking about the etiology behind the, the damage. Um, so that can happen postnatally. So it's important to try to, if it's known, deliver via C-section. When they are born, you get them on their belly, cover the lesion with sterile gauze, sometimes put them in a bowel uh, bag, do kind of your sepsis rule out, um, get your, your culture CBC, start them on amp and jet, and then they need to be transferred to a center that has neurosurgery who can fix the lesions. They do that at Akron Children's, but not, you know, every child born around here is born at Akron Children's. The lesions usually repair within the first day of life, um, but we're also doing a lot of monitoring. You know, when they're in the NICU, urology is usually involved because, like I said, the majority of them have some degree of bowel and bladder dysfunction. Orthopedics is usually involved because we can see things like club, foot, and knee and hip contractures right from birth. It's important to start intervening right then and there. We're also watching for the hydrocephalus. Um, you know, hydrocephalus is something that just develops right away. So most of the time when the lesion's being repaired, they're not, you know, treating anything hydrocephalus wise, but it's being monitored. So what are things that we are watching for uh, that would be signs of hydrocephalus? <laughs> well, it's hard because you can't just rely on the typical headache and vomiting you'd rely on for other people. Right, right. So what, you know, what are you going to rely on in a one week old? <clears throat> Oh goodness. Um, we already talked about how serial head cirques might not be the best, but um, it's still going to do it because if you have a rapidly right. increasing head circumference, that's going to be concerning. Right. Um, you could check interior fontanelle, I guess. Um, a lot about a fontanelle would be concerning. Uh, more more bulging than anything else. I would think, or pulsating maybe. Well, 
what else kind of on the head would be concerning? If you see a bulging fault now, the head size is rapidly increasing. Well, what's something else you're probably going to see? Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, posterior fontanelle palpation? I mean, uh, maybe. A, a splaying of the sutures. Okay, sure. So you see kind of the splaying of the sutures. That would be concerning as well. Um, we can see what's called a sundown sign which is where the eyes are locked downward and it looks like the sun setting over the horizon that's an upward gaze palsy so the eyes can't look upward um, okay and it gets into compression of those nerves what about you know the infant's activity level or the newborn's activity level imagine to be down yeah so if we're seeing true lethargy yeah, or true irritability and you know our definitions of lethargy and irritability are different than parents definitions of lethargy and irritability. So we're looking for true lethargy and irritability, uh, not tolerating feeds. If there's you know just recurrent vomiting, those would also be concerning signs uh, for hydrocephalus. So as I kind of alluded before with the Chiari 2 malformation, um, you can see here how the cerebellar tonsils have been pulled down into the frame of magnum. This should be gray because that's where the fourth ventricle should be, but it's compressed, so the CSF can't flow properly and it's backed up. There are five, kind of five types of Chiari malformation. Um, Chiari 2 is referred to also as Arnold Chiari malformation, and this is specific just to spina bifida because it is caused by the tension from the spinal cord being pulled out into that and pulling all of this down. PRA1 malformation is caused by crowding. So the you know occipital part of the skull is kind of undersized and because it's crowded, it kind of pushes the cerebellum down in here. PRA3 and 4 are pretty rare. You probably won't get asked about those on boards at all. And then there's something called a Chiari 0, which is Someone has symptoms of a Chiari, but they don't actually have a Chiari, and a lot of times they'll have a syrinx. So there's debate over whether or not it should be called a Chiari, but it still is called a Chiari. And again, you shouldn't really be questioned about that on boards. In addition to causing hydrocephalus, the Chiari itself can cause some other problems. So, you know, these kids are usually innovated a couple times. We'll sometimes see that post extubation strider. Um, if that strider is not going away, we have to think about whether or not the Chiari is causing some sort of anatomic compression on the airway. If, you know, they, they're having recurrent vomiting and it's not because of hydrocephalus, again, is that causing some problems? It can cause vocal cord aspiration, sleep apnea. So the Chiari itself, in addition to causing hydrocephalus, can sometimes cause some other issues. When there is hydrocephalus, the it's treated by putting in a shunt. And the shunt shunts away the CSF from one area down to another so that the ventricles can stay decompressed, the pressures don't increase, and we don't get brain swelling and further herniation. The idea behind the shunt came about in the 50s. Uh, prior to this, um, herniation was the, the cause of death of kids with spina bifida that had hydrocephalus. The pressures would build up, they'd herniate and die. There's a man who had a child with spina bifida. The surgeons kind of explained what was going to happen. The guy happened to be a plumber and started using this plumbing knowledge and thinking that in plumbing, we find ways to go around things and developed, you know, worked with the neurosurgeons and developed the concept of the shunt. The concept of which remains pretty much unchanged today, but it significantly improved the duration of life in individuals with spina bifida. The most common form is a ventricular peritoneal shunt, and this is just kind of refers to the start and end, where the shunt begins, where the shunt ends. Um, we'll see shunts in other places too. Sometimes it can go in the pleural cavity, sometimes it can drain into the atria, sometimes it can go into one of the um, veins. It just kind of depends on if some of these sites have been quote unquote used up. Anytime there is something foreign in the body, there's a risk for it not working the way it's supposed to. Both of you have spent enough time in the ER that you've probably heard it's never the shunt, um, but it is sometimes the shunt. Uh, 
And so, you know, we'll see in infants, we'll see similar things to what we would look for in the, the neonates as far as, you know, the bulging fontanelle, the change in activity level, vomiting, rapidly increasing head size, the sunset sign, the lethargy, the irritability. Um, in older kids, we can start to see some newer signs. So they might present with a, a particular headache or neck pain or back pain. Um, they might, you know, all of a sudden have trouble using their hands, their grip strength gets weak, they can't feed themselves anymore, start having trouble chewing or swallowing, um, their gait might change. They can sometimes see personality changes, so the parent will tell you, you know, this kid's super pleasant, happy, and all of a sudden he just kind of turned into the devil, was angry and aggressive all the time. And it's usually pretty quick. When we see a shut mouth function, the changes that happen are, you know, usually over the course of hours. And a lot of times the way someone presents with a shunt malfunction is going to be how they present with future shunt malfunction. And so it's important that parents are educated on what the potential signs of a shunt malfunction are, but also that they can identify those when it happens so that they know what to look for in the future and recognize it early. And these can even be things like older kids might be able to tell you this is my shunt malfunction headache. It's a very specific pain. It feels a certain way. It's in a certain location and they can tell you up. Oh, my shunt's not working because I have this headache. Parents can tell you these are the personality changes that they have. You know, they might throw up and all of a sudden they're angry and aggressive and the parent knows this is how they present. They have a shunt malfunction. So it's important that parents know that that presentation usually kind of looks the same every time. As we kind of talked about with, you know, the spina bifida occulta and the meningocele, uh, there's risk for tethered cord. There's risk for tethered cord with myelomeningocele as well. There's also something called lipomyelomeningocele, which is a skin covered lesion. It's not necessarily failure of the neural tube to close, but we have um, a whole bunch of lipomatous lesions formed in the spinal column, and that disrupts the the normal kind of process of the spinal cord and can you know the spinal column or the spinal cord can be just kind of weaved in and out of all these different lipomatous malformations and cause similar problems but the tethered cord you said is an abnormal attachment at the distal end so the cord is attached to something and it's tugging on it and it causes um, you know stress injury and mechanical injury as well as hypoxia um, and then that can lead to clinical symptoms. So we can see weakness in you know, the legs. We can see a change in the gait pattern. Somebody that may have had some sort of continence with bowel, all of a sudden they are incontinent or there's a complete change in their bowel bladder function. There's a change in their you know, gross motor skills. There's back pain or pain radiating down into their legs. The clinical signs of tether cord are usually a little bit more chronic than a shunt malfunction. And so the shunt malfunction it's, can be hours. With a tethered cord, it can be days, weeks, months. Okay? So it's usually a little bit more chronic. Um, if there's evidence of a tethered cord on imaging and there are clinical signs, then it's a discussion of, again, the risk versus benefits. It's not always a clear cut indication to go in and do surgery. Um, some of the detethering surgeries can put someone at risk for worsening function. So we've had some patients that, you know, had some degree of bowel, bowel and bladder function. They had a detethering function and they lost that continence afterwards. So there's possibility for risk. There's also a possibility for retethering. Thought to occur in up to 10 to 20 percent of people that have had a detethering. But again, we're not doing serial imaging of these kids, so there might be more walking around with a retethering. We just don't know because they don't have any clinical symptoms. We can also see what's called a syrinx, and I referred to this briefly when I was talking about the Chiari zero malformation because they have a syrinx. So a syrinx or a syringomyelia is an abnormal fluid filled cavitation of the spinal cord. So we get this pocket of fluid that develops within the middle of the spinal cord. It can happen anywhere along the spinal cord and can be varying sizes. It can sometimes be connected to the fourth ventricle and then it's called a hydromyelia. What happens then when this, you know, fluid filled cyst fills up, it compress, you know, it expands the spinal cord that ex uh, um, compresses on the 
the spinal the root canal or the the spinal roots and then that has a negative impact on the function so again we can see more kind of chronic changes because this is usually more of a slowly developing type of thing but if we see a gradual loss of motor function um, gradual loss of you know their writing handwriting skills decline they're weaker in their hands they complain about pain in their hands they start to develop contractures um, their hands their gait changes or change in bowel bladder function um, they complain about neck pain back pain so when there's more of a chronic type of picture of long-term loss of function we're thinking about tethered cord or a syrinx um, and so usually we're doing imaging of the whole spinal column because the syrinx can occur anywhere along there. If we just do, you know, an MRI of the lumbar spine looking for a tethered cord and there's a syrinx up in the thoracic region, you know, depending on where the imaging's cut off, we might miss that. Individuals with Spina bifida, especially myeloid meningocele, do have higher rates of cognitive impairments, and this is kind of general cognitive impairments, not necessarily just intellectual disability. We do see about 75 to 80 percent of individuals have an IQ in the average range. Um, we definitely see higher rates of learning disabilities, especially impairments in reading and in math, and this is thought to be related again to. Um, Similar to how when the spinal cord is pulled out to that sac, it pulls the cerebellum down and causes the Chiari malformation. It also can cause some dysgenesis uh, in the temporal lobes, and that's where a lot of reading and math um, function is in the temporal lobe. So that's more because of cerebellar dysgenesis. Uh, the higher the level of the lesion, the higher the risk for cognitive impairments. So, you know, those individuals that do have spina bifida and intellectual disability, more of those are going to have, you know, a thoracic lesion than a sacral lesion. We can also see executive function impairment, so visual spatial skills, organization, time management, memory. Um, ADHD is a disorder of executive function, so we can see, you know, higher rates of that or things that, you know, kind of moving in the direction of ADHD. A lot of kids with spina bifida are on an IEP in school, usually because of you know the physical limitations they need, you know, time for their bowel bladder regimen, and because of the higher rates of you know learning challenges. And it's important to you know educate families that because they have spina bifida, there are they are at increased risk of learning issues in these areas. And I encourage families to educate the schools and the teachers. That this needs to be watched out for and you know have kind of a low threshold for pursuing a multi-factored evaluation if they don't have one to determine if they do qualify for special education services or if they have special education services but just for physical do the, does that need to be redone and expanded because of academic performance we do see increased risk of seizures in spina bifida about 15 percent um, will develop seizures lifetime, but they're usually pretty well controlled with medication. Anytime someone has a hydrocephalus and a shunt and has a new seizure, also got to think about the shunt, the shunt malfunction or infection, because like I said, sometimes it is the shunt, despite what you hear in the ER. Uh, when we talk about neurogenic bowel and neurogenic bladder, this is because of the impaired neurologic input and output from those areas. So we have decreased sensation, but we also have ineffective coordination of the muscles that are needed to relax when they need to relax, tighten and contract when they need to contract in order to propel stool from the rectum um, and in order to sense when that needs to happen. A lot of individuals with neurogenic bowel are on some sort of bowel program that you know consists of dietary changes, laxatives, stool softeners, enemas. The goal of a bowel program is to have them going on a regular basis on some sort of schedule to prevent incontinence during the day. The goal isn't really to teach children to sense or to be able to control it, but it's to have them having bowel movements on a regular basis. So, you know, in the middle of the school day, they're not having um, increases and in having soiling. We'll also sometimes see kids have what's called a Malone stoma, 
um, named after the surgeon that invented the procedure. Uh, what this is is basically a stoma that goes into the large intestine and then allows for an enterograin enema. Um, so the individuals that have these, they usually have just kind of their bowel program where or their regimen where every night they sit on the toilet, they hang a bag of, you know, a lot of times it's just tap water and they basically just flush things out. So they sit on the toilet, let this flush out for 45 minutes. Pardon me for one second. Sorry about that. My air conditioning unit has to get its yearly service and they're calling to let me know they're on their way. So hopefully we get done, this done before they get here. Um, so that's what the Malone Soma does. And really the goal of that is just improve quality of life, make it to where they're going regularly and keep them from having accidents. Sometimes that needs adjusted. Um, you know, a lot of times when the question is asked is, are, are you satisfied with your bowel regimen? Um, and that's a, a telling sign, an important question to ask. We've also see neurogenic bladder, similar kind of concept. The neurologic, you know, the sensation from the bladder is impaired. The input to the bladder is impaired. So things don't relax or contract the way that they're normally supposed to. Um, and so we can see a lot of leakage incontinence, but if the bladder is kind of tight all the time, that can increase the pressure in the bladder. That can lead to reflux into the kidneys, which can lead to hydrocephal or um, hydronephrosis. So the mainstay of management with neurogenic bladder is clean intermittent catheterization, where individuals are cathing, you know, usually every two to three hours. And the goal of this is to just keep the bladder empty. So that pressures aren't building up. We'll sometimes use antispasmodics, anticholinergics, um, oxybutynin is the most common one. The goal of this is just just help the bladder relax, so that when there you know does start to get urine in it, it the pressures don't increase and it doesn't reflux back up into the kidney, um, and it just kind of increases the bladder capacity. We do still see you know higher rates of UTIs, urinary. Um, Urinary tract complications are still the most common cause of death in individuals with spinal bifida. Similar to the Malone, where we do a stoma that allows for kind of enterograde enema for a neurogenic bladder, one of the surgical management options is what's called a metrophanoff, again, named after the person that uh, invented the procedure. And what this is, is basically a stoma into the bladder that just allows for easier access. A lot of times we'll use the appendix if it's there to create the stoma and go in through the belly button and it just makes life easier um, for cathing. There's a variety of sensory deficits again because the nerves are damaged so they, they don't work as far as sending signals to but also receiving signals from. And so if they can't feel things, they can't feel pain, they can't feel trauma, they can't feel burned, that predisposes to ulcer formation because they don't sense it. Um, you know, a lot of these individuals are using different mobility equipment, whether it's bracing or wheelchairs. And when you use those, it increases, you know, friction, which again predisposes to ulcer formation. So, you know, we really stress the importance of routine skin examinations. And we really stress it to parents doing it. And then as kids start to get older, enter adolescence, we stress the importance of them doing it themselves, teach them, you know, how to use a mirror and position in ways that they can see their backside so that they can do it on their own and not relying on their parents, especially if, you know, they're getting into, you know, 18, 19, and they're wanting to move out, go to college, something like that. And they really need to be able to do this on their own. And if they are wheelchair users, then teaching them to, you know, do properly weight shift, make sure that they have a supportive cushion, that the wheelchair is not broken down and worn down. Um, 
infants that crawl or even, you know, we'll see older kids that crawling is their primary way of getting around. You know, that can put um, trauma on their arms since they're using their arms to crawl, but also if their thighs, knees, feet, toes are dragging on the ground, those can be kind of hot spots for potential for them. Um, Dr. Hall, who was the prior director of the Spina Bifida Clinic, had a patient one time who sat on a heat register but had no sensation and caused a burn injury because they couldn't feel it at all. So just yeah. kind of being aware of surroundings. Um, the orthopedic concerns, and we said club feet, contractures, um, variety of scoliosis, kyphosis. Um, we can see fractures. Fractures are concerning a lot of times because, again, there's not great sensation. So we'll see kids that might have fractures and not really know it. Um, you know, there might be a change in their gait just because their legs fractured um, and just isn't working right. So parents need to be kind of aware of what their gait patterns like, what their is like, and if there's a change in that, need to be aware. We need to look into it a little bit more. We'll see a majority of individuals with spina with spina bifida develop a latex allergy in their lifetime. That's thought that up to seventy percent will, um, and it's thought to due to the recurrent. Um, exposure to latex because of the procedures. We use just universal latex precautions. So if there's a child with spina bifida, latex is going to be on their allergy list, whether they have had exposure or reaction to it or not. We just use it as a precautionary measure. Um, that's why the hospital's kind of latex free. You can have latex balloons, bandages in the hospital. We can see cross reactivity with some fruits and veggies, tomatoes, avocados, certain berries, bananas. It's not a contraindication to these foods, but just kind of, you know, caution as parents are introducing these foods. Obesity can be an issue. Um, so in general, because the individuals with spina bifida don't have the same degree of motor function, they don't have the same caloric needs. And if they don't match their caloric intake to their caloric needs, then that can lead to obesity. Um, the higher the level of lesion, the less motor function they have, the bigger potential of a problem this can be. And individuals, a lot of times, who, you know, as they enter adolescence, are going to a lot of times make kind of a, a determination, a conscious decision as to whether or not they want to continue to work on mobility or be primary, primarily wheelchair users. And those that are going to be just wheelchair users, their caloric needs can often, you know, decrease 800 to 1000 calories. And without the proper nutritional guidance, a lot of times they don't decrease their intake. And so again, that can lead to obesity issues. Um, and then that can lead to cardiac sequelae, sleep apnea, and things like that. So nutrition counseling is an important part of this, even just for prevention. We can see some males have uh, sexual dysfunction. About 75% have erections, but most don't really have any control. And we can also see what's called retrograde ejaculations are common in males. Females typically have normal fertility, should use normal precautions. But as I said before, if a female has a neural tube defect, their risk of having a child with a neural tube defect automatically goes up to 4%. And we also see higher rates of precocious puberty within this population. About half of females and about a third of males will start to have signs of precocious puberty. And so they might, you know, fall with endocrinology because of that. We try to prevent things. Uh, folic acid fortification has been shown to be a significant factor as far as prevention. Um, different agencies have different recommendations for folic acid uh, regimen. AAP recommends 400 micrograms of folic acid for all women of childbearing age. FDA groups in Canada and UK recommend 400 micrograms of folic acid three months before conception in the first three months of pregnancy. The problem with that is, you know, people don't always know when exactly they're going to get pregnant or when they are pregnant. And as we kind of talked about with like the seizure meds, sometimes by the time someone realizes they are pregnant, we're past day 28. If the neural tube hasn't formed, then it hasn't formed. 
So the recommendations are 400 micrograms for the general population, but if um, a female's had a prior pregnancy with a neural tube defect, has a neural tube defect herself, or is on a seizure medication, then it's four to five milligrams um, as opposed to the 400 micrograms. And the US as well as other countries have had folate fortification programs in place since the late 90s with varying rates of decreases in neural tube defects um, in different countries. So the folic acid fortification program just in and of itself led to a decrease of 36% within the United States. Um, the folic acid recommendations for supplementation has decreased the rates by you know 50%. Our Milo Clinic is the largest multidisciplinary clinic in the hospital. Um, it includes developmental peds, physiatry, which is physical medicine rehabilitation, neurosurgery, urology, orthopedic surgery, gastro. Genetics used to be involved, but their structures changed. Social work, nursing, PTOT, speech, nutrition, and an orthotist. Um, and a lot of times, you know, the orthotist and PT and OT and physiatry and orthopedics are all seeing the patient together because there's so much kind of overflow with what they do. It's a little bit harder nowadays with trying to, you know, social distance, um, but a lot of times that's you know, usually a, a team based approach. In the United States, we do see, you know, varying amount or varying rates of individuals living independently. Um, you know, I have some patients and you know, we have a kind of a, a smoldering in our with our population. Some patients are living at home, have no jobs, pretty much do nothing all day and they're 21, 22 years old. I have some patients who, you know, are off to college in other states. I have one patient who does mission trips in Scotland um, and is in the middle of an 18 month mission trip in Scotland right now. So we see a, a, a wide range of that. A lot of times when I'm talking to a patient who's a high schooler, a senior high schooler, and I'm asking, what's your plan for after you graduate? If I hear, well, I think I'm going to take a year off and then go to college, I really do everything I can to encourage them not to do that. Because I find that if they take a year off, they don't have anything lined up, they continue to not have anything lined up. So I really encourage to, you know, consider college if that seems like the right thing for them. If college doesn't seem like the right thing for them, look into work placement programs or some sort of job, something to keep them active, give them something to do. Um, across the pond in England, for whatever reason, we see much higher rates continuing to live with their families. Um, we do you know, still see a decreased survival rate and urologic complications are still the most common cause of death for individuals with spinal cord. I always like to end on this slide because I think it just sums everything up pretty well. <laughs> <That's> the... <laughs>